All right, we're going to head to the lab now, and uh, Dr. Uh, Yeh is going to be doing uh, demonstrating CoFlex. Um, I'm going to give you the mic so that you can explain what you're doing, and then you can direct going from the, the uh, specimen to the sea arm, and we'll, I'll kind of moderate any questions that come from the audience. Okay, thank you. So the first thing we have is uh, the patient, and uh, we're going to shoot a lateral image here. X-ray, please. And I'm sorry I'm so rostral, but this patient has uh, pretty much all the spinous processes fused. So um, you can see X-ray there, please. So where my hemostat is, notice the disjunct between this uh, inner spinous space, X-ray here, and then the disc space. So that's an important thing to think about because uh, sometimes your lesion you're treating is uh, associated with the disc space. And in general, uh, you always have to carefully plan your incision right around the uh, inner spinous space, which will uh, best approach you for the carpentry and the instrumentation. So uh, if you can switch to the microscope view. So right now what we've done is we've exposed the rostral and the caudal spinous processes and I use a, a six or eight millimeter uh, drill bit. You see the lamina here, uh, rostrally, caudally. Let's just call this L2, L3. You see that the facet joint is very close together. And so at L2, L3, you, know, you can't take too much, otherwise you're going to destabilize the segment. Uh, so we know the disc space is gonna be up here. So if you're looking for, a, for um, a unilateral decompression to decompress the disc, remember Coflex is all about decompression. So uh, you'll, preferentially take the laminectomy or hemilaminotomy up higher on the side where you need to get that decompressed. So right now what I do, and this can be done very quickly, is um, uh, you, you just get the drill going and then you cut down to the quick So that takes about 10 seconds. And then you're using uh, some sort of ronger or pituitary to clean out the soft tissue. If you have to take spinous process, do you preferentially take it from the inferior or superior spinous process to, to fit the coflex in? Yeah, that's a really good question. In general, it tends to be the superior spinous process. However, if you're doing a two-level case, you really want to preserve the one that's in the middle because that's where you're going to have the fracture because of the tension. So in this case, um, um, I'm right in the middle. Uh, some people will use a, a Lexel Rongeur, which is about that same width, but I worry about cracking and uh, compromising the, the spinous process when I do that. So this is all the inner spinous joint, uh, and then we're getting down to the interlaminar joint here. And this can all be done very quickly without uh, really worrying about the thecal sac yet. So this is called the rostral landing zone, and you wanna make sure that you're getting a nice cut. Already, you can ask for the cofix trial, coflex trial, to kind of get an idea. So you see that's not going to be enough lift, and this is the 8 millimeter. So we're going to go to the 10, and this is that carpentry stuff where you're trying to really make a nice fit. So see, this is a, a really nice lift of about 2 or 3 millimeters. So I'm already thinking that this is going to be a 10 millimeter coflex. So here's the, uh, the landing zone in the bottom. I see the facet joint. You don't want to compromise that. Here's the facet joint on my side. So preferentially, I'm just going to take the laminectomy or laminotomy here. Sorry, there's no suction. Is there a suction? <clears throat> Everybody hold your breath. <laughs> Take the Kerosene 3. <coughs> so then with your Kerosene, you can start to finish the laminotomy. 
at this point, you're still pretty safe from the thecal sac because typically there's a lot of ligamentum hypertrophy. I'm taking these nice bites. I'm undermining. So this is what we would call, again, the landing zone up top. And then I'm going to find the landing zone down below. A mesial facetectomy here on the contralateral side. So that's the landing zone. While you're doing this, the assistant can help you by debriding all this soft tissue, and so that's what my PA usually does. Again, you're trying to make the, the prettiest carpentry you can because that translates into a really nice implant. So notice this is the the top part of the facet, the superior facet, the inferior facet is going to be below. That's going to be the key to decompress the lateral recess. So see how I sneak under there? I try to do these quick, quick bites before I actually see the thecal sac because, again, I want to work as quickly as possible, but I really want to avoid, obviously, any uh, spinal fluid leak. Uh, you know, I missed this because uh, Dr. Zucker and I had to go to the lab but the case that he showed for the discussion session, which was, you know, a grade one to two spondy, which had a dynamic component. Did you, did you, I mean, the low hanging fruit is a fixed grade one spondy for coflex. But when it moves like that, when I was doing these, it would make me nervous to do a coflex in a mobile spondy. And I don't know about limiflex. I don't know the technique. Was the case that that Dr. Ziegler showed with a little bit of mobility, too much mobility for coflex? Yeah, I think the weakness in coflex is always flexion. So if you feel like there's too much flexion, then that's not going to be a great case. So I would, I would move towards a, a fusion in that case, or let me flex perhaps. So here I've identified the landing zone on the bottom, and you see that? That's nice. Uh, I. I've done a lot of uh, contralateral, lateral recess decompression. I'm going to go now, and typically I will distract with a uh, nerve hook, and then uh, my assistant will come, and we're really getting under the, uh, under the inferior facet here. This will decompress the L3 nerve root as it's going to exit. So typically right now, we'll take a, um, a nerve hook, please, or that small curette. Yeah, that's fine. So with this pen field, typically we start at the midline and we try to find where that uh, ligamentum inflection is and see how we found that nicely. And by doing this, before I did coflex, I had a CSF leak rate of maybe two or three percent and uh, so far uh, we've been fortunate to be under one percent on the coflex and I think it's because you have the direct line of sight right to where the two layers of the ligamentum come midline and then you see there's the epidural fat and this should open up nicely like this so then uh, you quickly can take that ligamentum knowing that you have a nice plane dissected. Notice I've already trimmed the, this bone here so that that no longer is a stenotic. See how the, the, the kerosene just drops down into the lateral recess so that you can rapidly take these bites. Now at this point, because you're seeing the thecal sac, I would encourage you to slow down a little bit and uh, really take your time because um, this is where you get to really be one with the nerves. So see, we're getting a nice decompression here all the way out into the lateral recess. It's absolutely critical to get this. If you don't get this part, the patient's not going to be happy when they wake up. And this is where I think the advantage of uh, Coflex lies, that you can really see this from a contralateral perspective. So here's the L3 nerve root. I can kind of feel that. I'm completing the decompression here. Do you see that 
so see this, if you leave behind this ligament like this, patient's not gonna be happy with you because it's still compressive. But there's that final layer. Often you can leave the epidural fat there. I've taken a little bit of it, but now you see it's completely free here. <coughs> you have a ball probe there or something like that. No. Yes, do you do anything different than this? Yeah, so um, I want to give full credit to Dr. Ye. Uh, I did a couple of co-flexes and I was not super happy. I did have some spinous process fractures. I probably tried to jam in too much. I decompressed too much. Um, and then he showed me the subtleties and he came here for a lab and it was really cool. I uh, still do my inverted U, so the alphabet um, soup decompressions, inverted uh, U-shaped cuts for the laminotomy and a J-shaped cut. And it's probably more uh, uh, kind of restricted. Uh, we have an interlaminar spreader tool that we like to use to kind of distract a bit. And the main thing is that Dr. Ye pointed out a quality decompression with nice lateral recess decompression, but not over distracting, not blaming it in, uh, nicely shaping the spinous processes down so that it seats down without big blaming. Yeah, look at this tool. This is a, this is a David Ye special. He designed this. Very cool. Right. So a proprietary retractor, this was designed by uh, myself and uh, my partner, Dr. James Carr, and see how it comes in and gives you that low profile. If you're doing the surgery by yourself, this can uh, be a, uh, really a game changer in terms of seeing where you need to decompress. So those are one of the many subtleties, but a nice quality decompression. And I've been impressed. I mean, I have to say that this has been a huge addition to my practice. And I rarely, my fellows can attest to that, uh, uh, do fusions anymore for grade one spondies. I try to very much look at a decompression only in stabilizations and outpatient surgery. It's been very reliable. Yes, I still quote and put into the chart 15% risk of failure by five years. Um, but in the big picture, it's been an extremely satisfying procedure. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Ye, for coming here and uh, educating me on it. So here is uh, another critical move. Uh, often, for instance, if this were L4-5, you would see a patient with a little bit of dorsiflexion weakness, and so now we're, we're very comfortable that L5 is good. But L4, uh, as you palpate, I use this angled curate, which I think is a critical tool to come up right to, and you can feel and watch the thecal sac, talk to the thecal sac. You don't want uh, to abuse it, but you can just get down and there I'm going into the foramen where L4 is exiting. So I can actually palpate and get under there and then come back and reduce all of this ligament for the rostral nerve root. And I think that's another reason why Coflex fails because we're not doing this maneuver. Why? Because classically you would remove all of this and then you'd be able to see this stuff, but you're not seeing it here. So then um, you decompress with the curette and then bite it away with the kerosene. Let me ask Dr. Alleman, uh, Todd, for the Limiflex, do you have to make compromises or adjustments for your decompression? Do you decompress more or less? Uh, no, I think you need to do a complete thorough decompression in the way that you know how. Um, personally, uh, for that procedure, I, I do a bilateral laminotomy approach and preserve the midline structures. It's not necessary as long as you leave half of the spinous process above and below. So whatever decompression you're comfortable doing, you really just have to do a good one. So that's because the device does no decompression for you. So you have to do a really good one. I love that retractor, by the way. That is super that, slick. That retractor is very slick. I, and I used to do a lot of these um, before I stopped doing them just to be, be an artificial disc guy like Dr. Ziegler. And I, I've never talked to David about his technique. And the technique I used to use is identical, you know, particularly getting up, you know, at four or five, getting the ligamentum off where the four root comes out above that a lot of people don't get, um, and doing most of your decompression bony outside the ligamentum flavum so that, you know, less chance of a, a dural injury if you're just separating ligamentum flavum from, from, the, from the nerve root and you've already taken the bony roof off. So in my mind, I told you my schedule every day, I have to do this in the mornings and then afternoon, I have to talk to the patient. If I don't get this ligament out, I can pretty much expect that they're not gonna be happy with me. So I have a, 
always that voice in the back of my head saying, am I okay if I'm L5 here? Am I okay if I'm L4? And you can see clearly this is so nicely decompressed compared to the side that hasn't been decompressed. Uh, for time's sake, I'll just show you that we've trimmed the landing zone and we're ready to go. So at this point, um, I was testing, and this looks about the right lift, just about two to three millimeters lift. It's quite nice. Uh, you orient the coflex with the tines deeper uh, on the direction uh, which favors your approach, meaning if this is two, three, I'm probably going to reverse it. Um, it, it assists with the lordosis a little bit, but also more likely than not, L3-4 is going to give me problems later, and I will always want the opportunity to come back and use another CoFlex uh, in response to Dr. Chapman's uh, question. Yes, we'll come back and the patients get another procedure. So here, a um, little difficult with the microscope in the way, but... Um, We're a little trapped with the soft tissue, but we're almost there. So you want to get it a little deeper, obviously, than this. Let me just move the microscope one second. So that's looking better. So see how when I trimmed with the drill, I trimmed exactly enough where I thought that the coflex could come. And then on, let's say the patient was more symptomatic on my left side, I, I went a little uh, more on my side to make sure that this was decompressed, but this remains a virgin element. So uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Bourbon yesterday about a, a difficult uh, coflex revision he had and about the spinal fluid, uh, which is always uh, you know, our friend and enemy. Can I borrow that knife? <clears throat> I can't think of a time it's been my friend. <laughs> well, so let's say uh, this is the coflex you've done, and uh, of course we'll crimp it uh, to complete this. I, I would probably get this just a little millimeter deeper, but this, this is totally acceptable because as you take your nerve hook, you see that we're about two millimeters from the dura, maybe three. So maybe we could go another uh, millimeter deeper, but. For time's sake, let's just crimp it now and say that this is good. And let's say the patient comes back and still you're, you're problematic on the right side, even though uh, I hope I've proven to you that we've really decompressed the rostral and caudal nerve roots. Well, uh, take an 11 blade and cut right down to the quick of the coflex just like this, and you know exactly where the thecal sac's going to be. It's going to be uh, one or two millimeters deeper than that. At that point, you can dissect that. I use typically a Penfield 4 and rock it, loosen that, and take out the coflex. I have this completely virgin facet joint that's easy to dissect and use a transforaminal approach to uh, place an inner body in the disc. And at, the, at that point, uh, you do a nice discectomy, a fusion with an expandable cage to help your lordosis, and then swap out to a cofix interlaminar fusion device. Again, this is a revision decompression inner body fusion that can be done as an outpatient. Um, typically, we're doing this in 75 minutes, 80 minutes. The patient will go home in two hours. Sometimes we'll be doing this in the appropriate patients with, uh, again, uh, in spinal anesthesia. And um, the patients just, they do so well with this. Any questions from the crowd? No, that was a great demonstration. Thank you. You've got us back on time, so we doubly thank you. And uh, we'll go on to the 11 o'clock uh, session. Thank you.